Imagine, if you will, ordering a new laptop from Staples. A few days later, you excitedly open the box only to discover some assembly required. You'd probably be a little flummoxed. And yet, once upon a time, this was the norm. In 1972, you couldn't have bought a personal computer for yourself at all. Well, you could, if you didn't need a car or a house. Yet just a couple years later, the power of the microprocessor was yours, if you were willing to do a little bit of work. Computing in the early days wasn't for everyone. For most people, a television set was about the extent of their electronics gear. The people most interested in computing tended to be engineering and electronics enthusiast types. People who knew their way around a soldering iron. Which was good because the people producing the earliest computing kits were more or less the same. Since the initial market for computers were people who were literate in electronics anyway, it made sense to outsource assembly to them and get the prices low enough to generate orders and hopefully make a little profit down the road. And thus, kit computing was born. For some enthusiasts, kit computing was a bright light beckoning to an exciting digital future. For others, it was a decidedly less friendly experience. Building computer kits could be rewarding, but it was fraught with some peril. You had to deal with occasionally flaky instructions, poor schematics, and your own mistakes. And those mistakes could cost you some serious... If you persisted, the reward was a machine that brought the future right into your living room. But a lot of people didn't. They ran into problems they couldn't solve. Or their impatience got the better of them. So they filed their kit in the appropriate folder, or just stuck them on a shelf or in a laundry hamper, adding them to a long to-do list that would never be finished. Forty years later, these uncompleted kits have been popping up on places like eBay, as estate vultures, <coughs> I mean sellers, original owners and so on, discover or rediscover them and decide to give them a new home. And in a way, thank goodness, because thanks to the quitters, I mean delayed gratifiers, we have some precious, surviving examples of what they saw when they received their kits. And as it happens, I have a few of these mostly untouched gems. So let's have a look at what's been unearthed from those shelves and hampers. Okay, so first up we have the unbuilt motherboard of a digital group system. I've covered Digital Group's Z80 basic box in another video. Basically, they were an early computer manufacturer that offered a fairly versatile for its time system that allowed you to change from one CPU, say an Intel 8080, to another, say a Zilog Z80, by changing a board and nothing else. The motherboard is plated through, but you'll notice a significant number of the pins are not connected by traces. This is because Digital Group didn't really develop a standardized bus for all of their system cards. Every time you added a card, you needed to electrically connect certain pins from underneath with jumper wires. In fact, Digital Group systems had hinges in their chassis to permit easy access underneath just for this task. Digital Group was started around 1974 and developed some very nice, powerful systems that, unlike the Altair, didn't require a full panel of switches and LEDs. You simply turned it on and a monitor program was ready to start loading from tape. Digital Group unfortunately didn't manage their cash flow very well and went out of business, I think, somewhere in 1977. Anyway, I'm glad to have an unbuilt example of part of their kit, which went for around $600 when it was new. This next one is a memory and prom board offered by JR Components of Australia. This board was offered as an add-on to the Australian Dream 6800 single board computer. As described by its designer, Michael J. Bauer, the Dream 6800 was sort of a rip-off of the Cosmac VIP, only using a Motorola 6800 rather than an RCA1802. Like the VIP, the Dream 6800's interface is direct via a video monitor rather than an LED hex display. Bauer developed a monitor he called ChipOS, which was a port of the popular Chip 8 system introduced with the VIP. Chip 8 was specifically driven towards making games and simplified that process with a series of instructions that were easier to work with than processor opcodes. The Dream 6800 only came with two kilobytes of RAM and part of that was eaten up by the monitor and display. The board allowed you to add another four kilobytes of RAM as well as additional ROMs. JR Components was the original contractor that produced the Dream 6800 kit boards. It's kind of cool having an unbuilt example of their work in my collection, although it's tempting to build it since my Dream 6800's game capabilities are pretty limited with only one kilobyte or so. Since we're already touring Australian vintage gear, and since I'm situated only about 50 miles south of the Australian capital city of Whistler, British Columbia, uh, let's take a look at something special. This is an Applied Technology DG680 CPU card, and it's from around 1979. 
This board was designed by David Griffiths in combination with a video board he also designed called the DG640 VDU. This card was designed around the S100 bus, which had been popular for years following the debut of the Altair, but in 1979 was uh, just starting to begin to fade in favor of uh, other newer technologies. I'm pretty sure the DG part of the model name stands for David Griffiths, but I'm not quite sure why the other part is 680. When I hear that, my brain automatically assumes this must be a Motorola 6800 board, but this board is actually Z80 based. Griffiths also designed a monitor for the DG680 called DGOS. The two boards, along with some others produced by Applied Technology, would end up actually integrated into the design of Australia's very first domestic microcomputer, the Microbee. This CPU card kit is quite remarkable in that it's almost untouched. I say almost because, well, someone did install a few resistors before quitting. And they also stole from the package of ICs included in the kit. Uh, there would have been an EEPROM with DGOS on it as well as some support ICs. There is a single PROM here though. The ICs are stuck into a piece of styrofoam that's covered with aluminum foil and I'm assuming the foil acts as some sort of anti-static guard. Like many kit manufacturers back in the day, you got the non-static sensitive parts in a baggie just like this one. We've also got a parts placement diagram that shows where everything goes on the board. I always like to have these on paper rather than uh, in sort of a PDF format like you typically get online these days. And then finally we have this huge manual. The manual details construction, checkout procedures, schematics, the whole bit. And then at the back we have a staple of kit computing, the parts checklist. Uh, given how many parts were involved in these things, manufacturers were always careful to have you check to make sure you got everything okay. I'm not really sure how much this board retailed for. If I had to guess, I'd say $150, $200 maybe, give or take. That would have been the prevailing rate for a complete kit like this, I think, back then. And of course, you still needed the VDU board and also had to come up with a backplane, power supply, monitor, and keyboard all on your own. We here in North America sometimes forget that there were all these other developments and technology happening concurrently elsewhere. So I'm really glad to have this rare piece of the Aussie computing scene from back in the day. Okay, this next one's kind of neat. At first blush, it just looks like a blank S100 card. But in fact, this is a complete serial terminal on a board made by Electronic Systems, and it dates back to 1979. This board allowed you to have a direct keyboard and video monitor interface with any S100 computer system that didn't have one. Basically, instead of using a separate terminal, you could just install this board, connect it to your system's serial board internally, select your baud rate, and voila. You just needed a composite video monitor and an ASCII parallel keyboard, and away you went. But here's the twist with this board. You didn't actually even need a computer. You could forgo plugging this into an existing system and just build a terminal around the card itself. This card retailed for about $199.95, which I wouldn't call super cheap, but it was a lot cheaper than buying a standalone video terminal. Speaking of which, Electronic Systems offered a complete quote-unquote TV typewriter, a standalone terminal board also known as the Bay Area Terminal. I've been hunting around for one of these, but haven't found one yet. I'm very tempted to build this serial terminal card, but I'll probably opt to just scan it and etch a new one and try building that instead. Unbuilt cards are kind of a rarity and it's really cool to have one just like this. Next up we have an unbuilt card from a computer called the Byte 8. This was the Byte shop's attempt to grab some of the booming S100 market that cropped up in the wake of the Altair. By all accounts it was a solid machine, but it didn't sell in huge numbers. Apparently Byte Shop also sold individual components as kits. This is the CPU or MPU card from that system. This card would have been produced around 1976 and used an Intel 8080 CPU. I'm afraid I don't know the cost, only what I paid for it, which was about $75. I do believe the card was offered separately of the computer system though. I also got this 4K RAM board with it made by a company called Micro Applications. All I need now is a backplane, a bunch of chips, money, and a place to sleep outside when my wife finds out I bought more computer stuff. Okay, this is an incomplete but still interesting unbuilt kit. This is an Altair 680, which is a much smaller Motorola 6800 based companion system to MITS's famous Intel 8080 based Altair 8800. The 680 wasn't quite as popular as its bigger brother and can be really hard to find today. I stumbled onto this empty chassis on eBay, and then later on I happened onto an unbuilt Rev Zero 680 motherboard. It was mounted in a nice picture frame which the seller neglected to pack properly and, well, with the usual consequences. The Rev Zero board isn't very popular amongst Altair 680 collectors. The later Rev 1 board offered a fair bit more expandability, while this board was limited to a measly one kilobyte of RAM. I'm not sure if this chassis was ever used. It has some rust around the edges, but that might just be from storage. 
From the case lid, it looks like somebody was storing stuff on top of it. As I said, this isn't the complete kit. Uh, the complete kit looked more like this one at the Smithsonian. You can see like the Australian DG680, the parts are all in baggies. I am thinking about building this one one day anyway, if I can find a front panel board for it. I'm aware of other several unbuilt Rev Zero Altair 680 boards, so I'm not too paranoid about destroying history here. And like I said, the Altair 680 is pretty darn rare, so this might be the only way I actually manage to have one. But for now, I'll enjoy it as it is. It's a pretty cool thing to have. Okay, this next one is really special to me as I'm a huge fan of its creator. This is the TV Typewriter 6 and 5 8 kit. The name sounds a bit weird, but I believe that refers to the dimensions of the actual PCB. Back in 1973, Don Lancaster opened the door to the possibility of home computing with his famous TV typewriter. That machine was offered as a set of kit boards that allowed you to do exactly like it said, typewrite on your TV. In the years that followed, the TV typewriter was revised several times. The 6 and 5 eighths was introduced in the July 1977 edition of Popular Electronics and was offered as the board alone for $5.95 or as a complete kit of parts like this for $34.95 plus postage. The TVT 6 and 5 eighths is tiny by comparison to its forebears and was intended initially for use with the MOS or Commodore Kim 1. This TVT would give the Kim 1 a video and keyboard interface. Basically, you attach an edge connector on this side and then plug the board into the expansion edge of your Kim 1. And you could say goodbye to the hex keypad and display. You just had to invoke the special program that enabled the keyboard and video interface and away you went. This kit is completely untouched and came in its original, if slightly falling apart, envelope. All the parts are sealed in this bag with the PCB. Unfortunately, as it looks like the bag has never been opened, I'm reluctant to actually open it here and bring the board and parts out. But you can definitely see the brilliant blue color of the PCB, the tarnish of the untinned copper traces, and all the little parts stuffed in there with it. Here we have the original guide that came with the kit. Not much in here in the way of instructions. Those were provided in the magazine article this TVT appeared in. But it does have this section at the back, sort of a punch card style, where you could request a pre-programmed prom that could be customized to a different system if you wish to use the TVT with something other than a Kim 1. Pretty darn cool. All right, this is another uncommon one. This is a full-blown kit computer called the Central Data 2650. The 2650 was introduced in the April 1977 edition of Radio Electronics Magazine. It was based around a processor that is a bit unusual in home computing, the Signetics 2650. This was an 8-bit microprocessor manufactured by Signetics, a major IC manufacturer. It ran at 3.58 MHz, I think, and was described as being very much like a mini computer in terms of design, having been designed by a former IBM engineer to be functionally similar to an IBM 1130 mini computer. And I think it can address up to 32 kilobytes of RAM. The 2650 wasn't a very popular CPU generally, although it did find a home in some video game machines, as well as industrial applications. It was not common at all in home computing, thus making this central data kit very unique. This machine could interface directly with a parallel ASCII keyboard and video monitor. It had just one kilobyte of memory and used a 300 baud cassette interface to store and retrieve programs. I think central data offered this machine is basically just the printed circuit board and three 3624 PROM chips for about 115 bucks. One PROM is the character generator and the other two contain the supervisor program. I don't know, that program sounds kind of Orwellian to me. I am the supervisor. <laughs> I don't know how many of these were sold, but I scored this kit on eBay for 29 bucks. $29. Initially, I was a bit concerned because it looked like the board was all you got, but on getting the box, I discovered it had the three prom chips, which I'm hopeful are still good, as I don't see the character generator or supervisor program dumped anywhere online. The proms are sitting in this old, degraded foam which is crumbling to dust. I usually like to remove vintage NOS chips from this kind of foam. The foam can draw in moisture and it can actually rot out the legs of the IC. This kit also came with a handwritten IC checklist. I believe this was from the original owner trying to figure out which parts he needed to build it. Although perhaps Central Data could have produced this if the kit volume was low enough and they were just sort of doing it by hand. Anyway, it's a really cool kit and I'm very tempted to build it after scanning the board. I'm not sure it would be a crime against history to do that since I'm pretty sure this isn't the kit's original box or anything. Now here's a cool one. This is one of the very first joysticks ever offered for home computer use. This is the PPG-J kit by Southwest Technical Products. The PPG came out, I want to say, in either late 1975 or maybe 1976. As you can see, ergonomics were not really a consideration, nor apparently was a fire button. 
The PPG could be used with any computer with a parallel interface, although it was originally intended as an accessory to Southwest's popular 6800 computer system. These are pretty rare generally, and an unbuilt kit? Forget about it. We've got the original box, the construction papers, parts lists, and parts placement diagrams. We've got, once again, a baggie here with all the parts. And we've got disintegrating foam. Uh, yeah, this is what I was talking about earlier. When chips are left in foam in damp environments, the foam sucks up the moisture like a sponge and then transfers it to the legs of the chips. I'd be very surprised if a lot of these didn't just crumble off on removal. Some standoffs to lift the PCB off your table. And here's the PCB. I love that fluorescent green color. At this point, Southwest wasn't into tinning the copper, I guess. This note makes me wonder what might have become of the person packing this kit up 44 years ago. Hopefully they're still with us. The actual joystick part was this thing here. These potentiometers were used in stereos at the time to adjust the left, right, front, and back speaker balance. Southwest basically repurposed them for joystick use. Note the complete lack of a self-centering function. There was actually another version of this kit, the PPG-S, which used a slide control instead of a joystick potentiometer like this. I'm not quite sure what that looked like or how that would have worked. I think these retailed for about $39.95 for the complete kit, which is a fair amount of change back then. I literally just got this kit a few days ago and I'm thrilled to have it as I literally have everything else Southwest sold for the 6800. I was actually working on a replica of this which I'm probably going to finish as I'm not sure if I want to build this untouched kit or not yet. But so glad I have it now. If you're into Cosmac gear, you probably know the company behind this next kit. A little while after the Cosmac Elf project appeared in the pages of Popular Electronics magazine, Neutronics Research of Connecticut released a much improved version called the Elf 2, featuring a hex keypad, integrated pixie graphics, and even expansion slots. But Neutronics didn't stop there. They followed up with a new machine called the Explorer 85. This machine was based on the Intel 8085, a CPU that isn't quite as popular in home computing as its successors, the 8086 and the 8088. The 8085 was seen a lot in industrial applications as well as trainers for educational purposes. It has built-in serial communications, making it relatively simple to build a serial-based computer around. The Explorer is essentially a single-board computer that could be expanded via two S100 slots. Actually, you could purchase an expansion chassis that gave you six S100 slots arranged in a horizontal stack above the motherboard. The machine had a simple monitor that allowed you to view and manipulate the contents of RAM, but you could also run a Neutronics licensed version of Microsoft Basic. The machine could be interfaced with either a serial terminal or a hex keypad. This built one I have here was a keypad version. Unfortunately, the eBay seller I got it from sold the keypad separately. The unbuilt kit here is a serial based machine in its original box. And here's the familiar baggie of parts, including resistors, capacitors, rubber feet, and the interrupt and reset switches and key tops. I can't really tell if this is original, but it appears to have never been opened. Here's the ICs and sockets. Neutronics didn't provide very much that way. You've got the CPU, an Intel 8155 microcontroller, and the monitor ROM that provides serial output. Neutronics was known for their very good, easy to follow schematics and manuals. These are available online, but I'm really glad to have a copy. It's just easier to use, in my opinion, than scrolling around an Adobe Reader. They also included a parts order form. The Explorer 85 was available on several different levels and had all kinds of accessories available. The basic kit, like this one, was a level A, while subsequent levels added more and more gear, including the expansion chassis and the trunks as well, like serial terminal. This envelope was probably used to send the parts form back in if you wanted to order more stuff. This is the original order form for the kit. It looks like they paid about $132.95 for this level A kit. Okay, here's the manual. The manual sort of lays out the different expansion options or levels in detail. You can see here a fully kitted out Explorer 85 in the top photo with Neutronics' own chassis, the serial terminal, monitor, disk drives, and in the background an 8 volt power supply. Beneath it is the expansion chassis that allowed you to add all those S100 cards. 
The manual explains how to build the machine and do a checkout procedure to make sure it works. It also contains a parts list like our previous kits, and that's just to make sure they had everything you were supposed to get. They also give you a tour of the monitor program and show examples of how to view and edit memory contents. We also have a full listing of the monitor ROM, and I'm guessing that that was probably made available so that if you wanted to modify it for your own purposes, you could. And then finally, here's the board. Very shiny. I'm almost certainly going to leave this one alone. As I showed earlier, I already have a built board, and this kit is complete and untouched. Natronics is one of the few pioneer companies that is still around. They left computers though and went into some kind of machine press business. I'm glad they still exist, and I'm glad I have this example of one of their kit products. Okay, here's my favorite. This one deserves some introduction. Way back in 1974, before the Altair, the very first microcomputers to emerge were built around the Intel 8008 CPU. The first of these was the French Micro, followed by the American Selby 8H. The third of these was built by a young grad student at Virginia Tech named John Titus. He designed a kit computer dubbed the Mark 8 Mini Computer. The Mark 8 was kind of his thesis project. The Mark 8 is also sometimes referred to as the world's first full-blown kit computer. That depends, I suppose, on how you define kit. I have an original Selby sales brochure here, and although the Selby was most commonly offered in assembled form, it does make some mention of kits. I'm not really sure on that one. Titus built his prototype on VeroBoard. He then shopped the Mark 8 around to different magazines to see if any would be interested in featuring it as a project for their readers. He tried popular electronics first, but was turned down. He then redid his prototype machine on actual circuit boards and managed to get an appointment with the editorial staff of Radio Electronics. At their offices in New York, he demonstrated the machine. Radio Electronics somewhat reluctantly picked it up and featured it on the cover of their July 1974 issue. The 8008 CPU on the Mark 8 ran at a whopping 0.5 MHz. For RAM, you could configure it with as little as 256 bits or as much as 4 kilobytes. Later on, a higher capacity memory board would be offered that took the RAM up to the full 16 kilobytes the 8008 could address. However, most of the Mark 8s I've seen appear to have only installed 256 bits or so. I suspect this has a lot to do with the cost of RAM. The Mark 8 used Intel 1101 static RAMs, and you needed 32 of them just to make one kilobyte. So you can imagine how costly and involved that would be to have four boards full of them to get four kilobytes. And even the bunch of them that I bought here, I ended up paying several hundred dollars for, as they're quite rare today. Operating a Mark 8 was pretty basic, just switches and blinking lights. So it was kind of limited, but those buying one didn't care. A year ago, the idea of having a general purpose computer in your home was almost unthinkable. Now it was for real. I shouldn't say blinking lights and switches were the only way to interface with the Mark 8. In fact, the Mark 8 was considered the sister project to Don Lancaster's TV typewriter. In the article, there's some information about a circuit you could use to connect the two devices and have some form of video output. I've never seen the two machines operating like that, but I hope to someday try it out with my own TVT and the Mark 8 that I hope to build soon. In a typical electronics magazine project article, the usual deal was to showcase the whole of the project, including schematics and even miniaturized copies of the circuit board artwork, which the end user could blow up and etch themselves. If it was a larger project, they would often serialize it over several issues of the magazine, which also served to keep readers engaged. However, a project of this complexity was simply too much for that format. So, Radio Electronics only printed a few pages of the details in the actual magazine. You can see here they had a tear-off where you could fill in your personal information and request a special construction guide they created with the full details. You had to pay $5 plus postage and drop that in the mail and wait. And a few weeks later, this would show up. This is a very rare original Mark 8 construction guide. Nothing too fancy, but you can see it's pretty thick for what it is. The first few pages rehash the original article. I guess this was just to refresh your memory or provide reference in case your original copy of the magazine was lost. Going further in, the guide starts getting into construction. Further still are some experiments to use the lingo of the time. These were small programs that served the dual purpose of educating the user while also testing the machine to make sure it worked properly. Further in, you have the schematics. Radio electronics often had challenges with the accuracy of their schematics on these bigger projects. When I built a replica TV typewriter recently, I ran headfirst into mistakes, including one that had a diode in the power supply backwards. Luckily that error had been caught years ago. Nothing worse than firing up a power supply putting out multiple voltages with a diode installed backwards. At the very back of the book are the printed circuit board patterns. These would allow you to etch your own boards. The patterns give you each side of each board, 
as well as an alignment diagram that shows you how the two sides line up. Finally, there's a parts placement diagram. Etching two-sided boards, then as now, was a real challenge and very few people appear to have bothered. In fact, in all my research, I haven't been able to find a single Mark 8 that was built using homebrew boards. Getting both sides to line up, as I can attest, is a bit of a nightmare. To save on cost, the Techniques kit boards did not have plating to connect both sides of the board electrically. This means if a component needed connections on both sides of the board, you had to solder it on both sides. Solder con socket strips like these made that a bit easier. You tore off as many pins as you needed, soldered into place, and then broke the metal tab off. Now, I did say this video was about kits. Technically, this construction booklet alone could comprise a kit. If you knew how to etch circuit boards, you were off and running. John Titus didn't offer any of the other parts required, such as integrated circuits or resistors or such. You had to find those yourself. However, Titus did arrange with a New Jersey company called Techniques to produce batches of circuit boards for those interested in building a Mark 8 without the hassle of etching their own. According to the Bike Collector website, Titus examined his old tax records and estimated that about 400 sets of these kit boards were offered. You could order the boards by sending in an appropriate amount of money to Techniques via the Radio Electronics article. I'm not sure why the price of each board varies, I'm guessing some boards were more difficult than others to produce. Anyway, if you sent out 4750 a few weeks later, these would arrive. Yes, these are original, unbuilt Mark 8 boards. And to give you an idea of how rare they are, consider that only 400 sets of them were made in the first place, and that in my own research, I have only been able to verify the existence of perhaps 20 of these machines today. 20. That's less than half the number of Apple Ones in existence, although the Apple One is much more valuable. John Titus was an engineering graduate after all. He didn't start a trillion dollar hardware company. That being said though, Mark 8s are anything but cheap. One very rough condition machine sold recently on eBay for over $12,000. That's definitely spouse making you sleep outside territory. As far as I can tell, these are one of possibly only two sets of unbuilt boards known to exist, and the other may, at least from what I was able to suss out from their owner, have some signs of attempted building. In fact, that's a common situation with the Mark 8. Owing to the design's complexity, a lot of people simply gave up partway through. Some, like the original owner of these boards, never even got around to collecting parts, tossing the boards in a hamper to be discovered 40 years later by estate vultures, <coughs> I mean sailors, and hawked on eBay. And thank goodness for that, because we wouldn't have them here if that hadn't happened. I bid 1550 US for these, and held the lead for the whole auction, only to watch it being chipped away by the inevitable snipe bits. When the timer went off, I had won them by just $15. I'm actually quite surprised they didn't go for more. But anyways, so what if I had to sleep in the doghouse for a week after? These are priceless artifacts. These boards are absolutely pristine in their original Techniques plastic bags. They even have little spots where the tinning is filled in the holes. There's absolutely no tarnish or rust anywhere. No sign of soldering iron was ever taken to them. Unbelievable, and a reminder that you never know what lurks at the bottom of an old hamper. The Mark 8 is comprised of six two-sided boards. The CPU board, the address latch board, the input multiplexer board, the 1K memory board, the LED register display board, and the output ports board. As I said, I've never seen a Mark 8 build from owner etched boards, but if you see a set of Mark 8 boards advertised anywhere, one thing to check for is this little symbol here. This is Techniques' Mark, and it only appears on the kit boards. It was not incorporated into the designs printed in the back of the construction manual. You should also be aware that there were a couple of reproduction kits of the Mark 8 offered over the years. One was by a company called Uptronics. Unfortunately, at times, some unethical eBay sellers have offered these up, pretending not to know that they're reproduction boards and trying to sell them for thousands of dollars. One way to pick them out from originals is the board substrate. The modern kit boards usually are made with this brownish-yellow epoxy that is very obviously modern. 
Vintage boards are usually this fluorescent green color, and they often have these little stampings that designate which company actually fabricated the substrate. TC, for example, stands for tailor clad. This is still done today, but it's much less common. Now to confess, I was thinking at one time about building these originals. I actually collected a whole bunch of date code correct parts for them, including this 1974 second source 8008 made by a Canadian public-private partnership called Microsystems International Limited. But I had a change of heart after an informal poll of vintage computer people on the forums. The conclusion was that building these today might be like drinking margaritas out of the Holy Grail. That put me in a bit of a situation since I wanted to build a Mark 8, but I really wanted it to look fully authentic. Thankfully an eBay seller got me out of my bind. He put up a whole slew of vintage blank PCBs from Synthane Taylor. The best part, the bags these boards were in still have their original stickers, which showed exactly when they were produced, 1973. These boards were half the thickness of a standard PCB, but that was fine for me. That meant I could etch on one side of the board and then etch the other side on another sheet and bond them together. And that's what I did here. The look is pretty darned authentic, and even the unsightly glue spots give it that eons in a garage look. Nice, eh? So probably I'll build those, not these priceless artifacts. Still amazing that I have them though, and three extra RAM boards to boot. The original owner of these was apparently pretty ambitious and eager to go for the full 4K. The Mark 8 was only out for a short while. The 8008 was a bit on the feeble side for serious tasks. A quote attributed to Bill Gates alleges that the 8008 would never be able to run BASIC due to the lack of a programmable stack. That isn't quite true, but in any event, the successor to the 8008, the Intel 8080, was out shortly before the Mark 8 made its debut, and it was pretty much superior in every way. Popular Electronics, stung that they've been beaten to the kick computer punch by Radio Electronics, got their revenge with the 8080-based MITS Altair 8800. That machine was built by an actual company, and it condemned the Mark 8 to historical curiosity. That said, the Mark 8, despite its short, useful life, did leave a significant legacy. It spurred the creation of user groups dedicated to hobbyist-built computers. It also led to the creation of a company called The Digital Group. Dr. Robert Suiting, the founder, had been an early Mark 8 builder. He was so enthused by it that he developed a series of improvements covered in what was called the Digital Group Packet Number 1. With these improvements, the Mark 8 could be souped up into a, basically a full-blown computer with keyboard input and video display. Suiting started Digital Group as a corporation shortly after, and the rest is history. At any rate, I'm thrilled to have this. This is literally the crown jewel of my collection. There aren't many people who can claim to have a complete, unbuilt Mark 8 kit. This will be something I'm sure our family will hang on to for a while, and probably one day donate to a museum where it can be appreciated by all. Thanks for joining me on this little trip down memory lane and checking out all these unbuilt vintage computer kits. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it's been somewhat uh, informative for you. Uh, if you like what you're seeing, um, I do have other videos. Also, feel free to hit the subscribe button. You'll be notified when more come out. Hopefully, you'll see me next time uh, without the COVID hair and everything else. And uh, we'll be back to normal times. But uh, if not, um, then I might be a little grislier. But we'll have something interesting for you to watch. And again, thank you very much for watching.